Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 134 of Small Business War Stories. And today I stopped in Nashville, Tennessee. And I sat down with Walter Carter of Carter Vintage Guitars. And uh, in a very short period of time, relatively short, in f- at least for this kind of business, uh, Walter and his uh, business have become one of the preeminent uh, businesses for, for vintage guitars in the world. People come from all over the world to Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, uh, they come there to to find the best uh, the best gear, and uh, that includes a lot of uh, very well known artists that uh, frequent the store. Matter of fact, as I was wrapping up recording this episode, Dan Auerbach from Black Keys was just casually walking around, you know, looking at guitars, trying to see if he could get something new. But uh, Walter is a really, uh, really, really impressive. Uh, he's been in the industry for a long time. And uh, he told me a lot of great stories about what it means to run a vintage guitar store in Nashville. This episode is brought to you by Gusto. Our sponsor, Gusto, it's a G-U-S-T-O. And Gusto is a company that helps you with uh, your payroll and your benefits and doing the things that are really kind of a pain to do. Uh, that really no uh, small business or large business owner ever uh, wants to take care of. But you have to because it's uh, what's the law. It's good for business. Uh, it's it's thing, uh, These are the things you have to do. So payroll, benefits, taxes, things like that. So go check them out. Gusto, G-U-S-T-O dot com. And when you run your first payroll, you get three free months. And actually, I'm sorry, go to gusto.com slash war stories because then... It, uh, you let them know that you found out about them on uh, Small Business War Stories, and that helps you, it helps them, it helps us, it helps everybody. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode, number 134, with Walter Carter of Carter Vintage Guitars. And we are live here this morning here in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Walter Carter, who is the proprietor and did you found it? Were you the founder as well? Yeah, I would say co-proprietor, co-founder with my wife, Christy. Great. Co-founder, co-proprietor mm-hmm. of Carter Vintage Guitars. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, uh, th- you run an iconic uh, Nashville shop. And, and it's, uh, it's really interesting to be here. And I have, I have so many questions for you about what it means to be a physical uh, mm-hmm. you know, a retail instrument store in, in the 21st century. But how, how did you and your wife decide that you wanted to stock this location with thousands of uh, vintage uh, guitars and amplifiers well we were working for another dealer okay um and i don't it, it was groom guitars i think everybody <clears throat> knows that okay and uh the time had come to leave there and, and go out on our own and we looked around nashville for locations uh we we felt we needed a, a real store yep. if we could find the right place and uh, this place had um, it just suddenly came up for sale. We had looked at it uh, under other circumstances and where, where it wasn't feasible. Uh, and then all of a sudden it was. So we bought the building, confident that the more confident in the real estate deal than in the business proposition <laughs> sure. of a of a, a vintage guitar store. Yep. And and so we rent. We worked out of our house for a few months until the renovation was complete. Okay. And opened the doors in uh, June of 2013. So, so yeah, you're relatively new on the scene. Yes. Compared to somebody like Gruden, Gruden's been around for decades and decades. Right? Yes, since 71. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so what was that thought? Pro- I mean, so the, it's interesting that I did not know the story behind the real estate, which we can talk about what uh-huh. this area of Nashville we're sitting in here. Actually, I've had Third Man Records on the show before, which is not too far from Right, me. yeah. Um, but I'm really interested, like, what did you what did you see in the market at that point? Because Gruens is an institution; it's been around for a long time. They're known nationwide, and probably worldwide, as like uh, uh, having been in a historical authority on you know appraisal and vintage guitars. 
what made you think like okay there's a need in a market for another large you know powerhouse uh, vintage guitar store in nashville well we we never thought we'd be as big as we became or or that we would grow as quickly as we did uh we just we thought there was room and within a, a month or two of just working out of our house people heard about us and we were dealing with people that we had not known before mm-hmm. which was a surprise to us we expected you know old friends to to be clientele sure and i don't know we just um we kind of went blindly ahead um with without being critical i think we learned things you should do as a guitar dealer and some things you shouldn't do oh i'd love to hear some of these <laughs> <laughs> so what are some things and, that you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't do mo- as a, as a oh it's mostly attitude and it uh that's not just a, a so that's sl- really important no it's not just a slam on on one dealer i think we all remember maybe maybe some people forget the going into guitar stores as kids and when you know you, you try to act like you're interested in buying something but the you know the guy the the owner of the store knows you don't have the money yeah and and then it's a matter of how you you're treated and usually you get the evil eye and you're uh, almost all, all guitar stores when I was a kid were new, uh, d- dealt in new instruments. So, you know, you're, you run the chance or the owner runs a chance of, of having his instruments scratched up and, you know, by kids who, who maybe eventually are going to buy something. But uh, it, it was always an uncomfortable, we were always looking over our shoulder. When's that guy going to come over and, and tell us to stop? Mm-hmm. So it, it starts there and then just in, in, in other stores and in, you know it's not just not just music stores it's it's any store where you go in and you you feel like you're getting a cold shoulder from the staff mm-hmm. and we just want to make sure that that we didn't do that and so early on we started tagging ourselves Nashville's friendliest guitar store mm. uh it's become more and more difficult to be that now because we we've, we've got uh you know such crowds in here a, a lot of the time yeah you and, do and you know, sooner or later, somebody's going to feel uh, neglected or ignored, and um, you know it's hard. But we we try not to. But your guitars to have that are happen. accessible, so I've been to yeah. uh, hundreds of guitar stores all over the country, mm-hmm. uh, and I've interviewed some iconic ones. You know, awesome vintage guitars, uh, mm-hmm. Chicago Music Exchange have been on the show, and uh, actually, all three of you have like in this attitude of you know come and play this ten thousand dollar thing, right? Uh, which is. Um, you know, you, you do, you do have that. I guess the, it, it start if there's too many people and people feel like they're not getting enough attention. Now, what mm-hmm. is the, uh, what is, what's the downside of that? I mean, I guess some once in a while you do have something get scratched up. Well, we, you have people playing guitars. They don't have any business playing sometimes. Yeah. Uh, or you, you have a, a syndrome where people come in and, and they just want to jam because they, oh. they think we'll let them uh, jam. And, and that, you know, we, we've never said this directly to a customer. It's like, but you're you're welcome to play anything, but you're not entitled to. Mm. So I mean, it's a it's Good a matter. Of, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's a matter of mutual respect, and uh, sometimes uh, the customers overstep that that boundary. But for the most part, they're welcome to to play anything, and it's really, you know, there, there's some reward that we get from from seeing a kid uh, playing an expensive instrument, a lore mandolin, or a a pre-war Martin or, or a Gibson and, and then, you know, seeing the light go on and, uh, where they've, they've, they see the difference between an old guitar and, and, and the one that they own Yeah, and, and understand why the prices are high, but, yeah. but they appreciate the, uh, well, it took the, me a long time from being that kid to actually being able to to have <laughs> one of those older guitars. So, yeah. but you know, yeah, I hear. But it, it plants a seed. It does plant a seed. And and if if you're around long enough, then then you know you'll you'll reap some reward from that. Yeah. And if not, I mean, it's, it's still it's still a, an emotionally rewarding experience to 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 make somebody's day better. Yeah. That's awesome. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you are a part of the community because there's many, many different aspects of this. There's the little kid walking in and the light going on. But then there's also, the last time I was here, I came in when I interviewed Third Man a couple of years ago, I, I casually ran into Sturgill Simpson, who, like, we started talking about the show, actually, for a few minutes because mm-hmm. we were talking about how, like, you know, small business in America is, like, is a thing and, and, and the importance of highlighting that. And he's a real nice guy. 
you also have so you have a lot of people who are big part of the national music community come through here so what are the ways in like the entire spectrum from that little kid to you know major recording artists how do you see your involvement with that with the community well we're we're pretty much open to everyone every segment of the market does some business with us right. uh, we've we've got some lower usually keep some lower price guitars yeah uh that are <clears throat> down at a starter level yeah and then uh we deal of course with collectors of vintage instruments and then there's a the the local professional musicians uh and then local artists like like sturgill and and there were there were three or four guys that started out uh right about the time we opened our doors and and nobody had heard of them right then but they did very soon after yeah and sturgill was one uh chris stapleton was another yep uh and jason isbell yeah and and then and the, and the list goes on so yeah. uh th- those are people who um who were friends and virtual unknowns as artists they yeah. just uh, we're, we're guys who like the atmosphere here. Yeah, uh, we get then they're the professional guys, the studio guys. Uh, that's not as big uh, part of our market as people would expect. Interesting. How come? Well, they're, they're two things. One, they they're working all the time. They're they're not typically collectors. They're looking for tools. Yeah. And once they find the right guitar, uh, or or set of guitars they they're not really looking for for anything better got it and uh, a lot of times vintage guitars uh, may fall short in terms of uh, the perfect balance of, of tone and volume up and down the fingerboard mm. and also intonation and playability and yeah, all that. yeah yeah so it that's that's a a whole different it's, it's a lot different than playing live right um and you know, every, everything has to be really exact. And there's, you know, there's only so far that pitch correction can go. You know, it, yeah. it can't fix a, a, a out of tune guitar. Yeah. And and really, the I think people don't realize the how how balanced and, and even toned uh, you have to play to be effective as a studio player. Okay. Um, so that a lot yeah. of times they're looking for yeah more of a precision tool yes than like a tool of emotional expression that's maybe like you know right. uh, Chris Stapleton's like 50s LG2 that he plays yeah. on stage right yeah. that's more yeah. he probably doesn't play that in the studio uh, he might he, uh, might. he uses a, a lot of guitars in the studio okay. and his producer Dave Cobb has has a, a collection of guitars also so mm-hmm. both of them uh, appreciate vintage guitars and yep. can use them at you know at their strengths okay and and then we have uh, you know, a large, uh, a higher tier of stars that uh, may or may not come in if they're playing or recording in Nashville. Mm-hmm. But we've had people like uh, Pete Townsend and, and Carlos Santana yep. come in, and uh, also some actor uh, musicians like Jeff Daniels. And, okay. Um, so we've we and and then they're the they're the, they're the sort of the I guess guitar tourists and. Um, we've become a bit of a destination. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of a semi guitar tourist. I can, yeah. I can relate to that term. <laughs> yeah, and they may or may, may not buy something. That, so there's a there's a, a semblance of a or, or kind of a atmosphere of a museum here for for some people. Yeah, you know, comes you know, and our sign actually says C Carter Vintage, just like modeled after the C Rock City. Okay, signs of yeah. of another generation. So we have we have people now coming in. Uh, just to see the store, yeah. and, and you know, maybe they'll buy something. They may not even be musicians. Probably one in a group of four is yeah. something like but that. But then you also have uh, addressing that part of the market. You have an entire segment uh, area of the the front of the store where you're selling T-shirts and merchandise. So those people who see it as a museum probably do spend money on that. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a we make sure we have something that has our logo on it, or just Nashville. A lot of people want to take home something that says Nashville. So that's uh, we we would starve if we had to depend on that, but <laughs> but that's a little bit of icing on the cake, and yeah. uh, it's of course the, with the t-shirts especially that's um, in, in most cases it's free advertising and, and free promotion. Yeah, um, it's we, funny. The first time I ever heard of your store was because I so I, I started out building. And now I restore like old harmonies and silver tones I mm-hmm. find on the road, and I've been dabbling in some higher end stuff. That I just love to have a shop in my house. Um, about five years ago, I started by building cigar box guitars and, um, the local, uh, I was at SF guitar works. I don't know if you know that, that mm-hmm. shop in San yeah. Francisco. 
um, I took a setup class from them and learned like the beginnings of the craft from them. And they referred a high school student to me who was building a cigar box guitar. And I taught him how to build it. And that was a senior project or whatever. Now he's like an incredible musician at Berklee College of Music, far exceeding anything, any ability that I've ever had. And uh, he, as a thank you present for helping him build the cigar box guitar, gave me a Carter Vintage guitar T-shirt. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, I wish you would send us a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for yeah. sure. People send us pictures from all over the world where they're, they or, or they run into somebody wearing one. Yeah. So we, we sell quite a few. We've given away a few. And uh, it's, it's worked pretty well for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about how the, more of those um, efforts. You guys do a really good job, especially recently. So I've seen uh, over the last probably, I, you know, I don't know, a year and a half maybe, there's been like a, a ramp up in your use of uh, content and social media. So you guys have been doing a really good job. You have your own YouTube channel where... Uh, folks like there's an entire new generation of folks like the Joey Landris and Ariel right. Posens of the world that are you know kind of coming coming up, um, and uh, and also you know I've seen other folks uh, other artists playing. So you bring in uh, emerging and established artists and play and you do videos of them playing some of your vintage guitars. Tell me more about that. How do you guys think about that? And uh, because I think that's I'm, in my eyes at least been really pretty effective for you. Well, our, our social media just started from nothing. Uh, the, our website, the, the first version of it, I wrote it in HTML because yep. I had a copy of HTML for dummies. <laughs> and and that's, that was the extent of my, uh, my knowledge, but it worked yeah. uh, until we had more than a couple hundred guitars. Um, and, and then we, you know, at the same time, uh, YouTube was free. So yep. we, didn't, we had no advertising budget at all. And so uh, we, we had a camera that we, uh, a Nikon that we took uh, the, the product photos with and we we're going, I think this thing will, will take movies also. Sure. We'll do video. And, you know, I Googled, I didn't have a manual. So I Googled and there was a, this lengthy thing about how to do good videos. And I said, that's, that's really complicated setting all the, uh, you know, setting the aperture and, and, and everything. And, and then I, I found something else that said, you press the red button <laughs> and it records. So, so we did that and uh, we had a, a monopod rather than a tripod because it was cheaper. Yep. You know, we could save 30 bucks. Yep. And then um, we had a guy who was helping us out. Uh, his name was Josh Alexander. Uh, and you know, he just set it up and filmed somebody one day. The first guy was a, a songwriter friend of mine named W.T. Davidson. And and we put it up and you know a few people saw it and then we did a few more and um at one point we had a bunch of banjos and we asked charlie cushman uh, a really well-known banjo player if he'd come in and yep. we just sat him on the couch out there and, and and turned the camera on uh and sold a few banjos and and we didn't we didn't tell him what to play or you know he just, we just with all of these guys from the very beginning it was play whatever you want to and uh, to to help promote the feeling that this was just a friendly place where people come in and sure and sit down and pick and I think we we gained our first notoriety uh, when we had Chris Thiele come in he had called us on a it was an Easter Sunday mm -hmm. being from another planet he didn't realize it was Easter yeah so um, Christy and I came in and we called Josh and he was. Uh, Having a, he, he was asleep, I think, in a rocking chair on his grandmother's porch that morning <laughs> after a big breakfast and a couple of Bloody Marys. But, but he came in, and, and Chris sat on the couch and, then, and just played through uh, you know, eight or ten instruments, and all, all of our good mandolins at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that gained a lot of notoriety. Uh, we also, J.D. Simo was not very well known at that time, and uh, he demoed the the guitar the electric guitars and some of the acoustics too he's a really uh, well-rounded player uh, much more so than than i think people realize who who saw his live shows at that time mm -hmm. and it just grew from there and uh, gradually we, we we got our technology our production values got better and uh, we hired a guy named john roncolato <clears throat> roncolato who still in, is the guy in charge of that and uh, he was more serious about photography and video, 
and, and brought a higher quality to our, our instrument photos. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then everybody sort of just pulled in friends. Well, people would come in. Uh, Christy was pretty shameless about asking them if they wanted to do a video. Some, yep. of, them, some of them did and some of them didn't. And, uh, you, and you never knew what was going to happen. Uh, I think you know, Brian Setzer was sitting in here uh, of the Stray Cats mm-hmm. and uh, picked up an, uh, an acoustic arch top and did the old thing Sweet Lorraine and he actually stumbled a little bit in the bridge and found the right chord and kept yep. on going. And you know, all of a sudden, that that was several hundred thousand views, which was a level we had never reached, and we don't. Some you know, somebody must have tagged it somehow. Yep. But um, you know, we were uh, just much more successful again with like like the whole business with that sort of thing than we ever planned. And it was always just just to try to you know promote that uh, you know this is a, a cool place to be. Yeah. And it's worked out well. Now, now we almost have to turn down people from really? time to time. Yeah, we want our our band to do a video there, and so, um, you know, some people would view it as a stepping stone. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. And you, and there's sometimes you don't have the bandwidth to do it. No pun intended. Well, <laughs> uh, pretty much anybody who who wants to. I mean, we can't. We're slow in getting them up, so yeah, uh, it's not always as good a promotion as they as they might think, but. God, you know, you hate to be in a position to turn somebody down who wants to help you out. Right. That's true. That's true. And we take a quick break in our conversation with Walter to talk about our sponsor, Gusto. That's at G-U-S-T-O. Go to gusto.com slash war stories. And Gusto helps you if you have a challenge with keeping track of things like payroll benefits for your employees, like figuring out, you know, what uh, tax withholdings you need to do, all those things that are a pain for small business owners and operators to do, but they're really necessary, especially once you start adding uh, employees and headcount. And I do want to ask you also, before we get back to the conversation, to share this podcast with one person whom you think would be interested in this conversation I'm having with Walter. It really helps uh, keep the lights on uh, at, for us to be able to, uh, one, have our listeners support our advertisers and have our listeners refer other listeners. Thank you so much. Let's now get back to the conversation with Walter in Nashville, Tennessee. So let's talk about the importance of physical stores in a 21st century where so many things are available on the internet. Because even vintage guitars, right, with the yeah. advent of like some like Reverb.com, um, you uh, you can buy stuff. Uh, I mean, we're, we're sitting here in the high-end room, by the way, so we're surrounded by probably, I'm going to say two to three million dollars worth of guitars or something <laughs> like that. Maybe, maybe, maybe less than that, but uh, yeah. somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, they're all they're all on our website. We uh, we don't uh, do very much on Reverb, um, okay. and we do a little bit on the Mandolin Cafe. Okay, but for the most part, I, I think now we've gotten well known enough that people look at our website as well. Mm-hmm. And you know, several of the larger dealers don't uh, don't put their stuff. What Reverb has done, and before that, uh, G Base, and and before that, eBay has given every individual uh, essentially store status or at least the, the opportunity or the gateway yeah. uh, to, the, to the rest of the world. They still have to establish themselves as, uh, you know, as, as trustworthy and uh, competent uh, yeah. in describing and, and representing instruments. Um, but I, th- I think having a store, an established store, um, I mean, if, if you've got a problem with somebody on Reverb, I, you might have some recourse and you might not, um, you know, other than challenging a credit card charge. Yep. And, um, you know, with, with someone has a store, you know where they are. Yeah. And, you, you know, the, the phone number's good. Uh, if you're in the, anywhere near, you can come by. Right. And, and you know, that's sort of the, to address the, uh, the problems that may uh, come up with, with online uh advertising but um, there's still no no substitute for playing an instrument right I and mean, we sell a lot uh, to people uh, that where they haven't where we mail them out and basically on approval mm-hmm. 
but uh, we we try to describe them uh, in, in as much detail and uh, so that even though you can't play it, uh, you, you you shouldn't have any surprises when you when you get it. But there's no there's no substitute for uh, being able to play an instrument. We had a guy in the other day. Uh, we had something, and it might have been a new instrument, and he could get it online from Guitar Center for a couple hundred dollars cheaper. Yeah. Except he would have to take just order it, click and buy, and they would ship it and, and pray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't I don't know how Guitar Center works. There there's some discounters uh, that that would never even open up the box. Just slap a new label on the box from the manufacturer and not mm. not have even looked uh, at the guitar. So uh, he chose to pay us the, the extra, you know, the premium price for yeah. uh, for the the chance to try it out, to know what he was getting. Now, pricing guitars. So when you were a grooms, probably pricing guitars used to be kind of a dark art. You know, like there's like there's like these books that were sometimes right, <laughs> sometimes not, and then there's uh, now with the advent of Reaper, you can actually look at the last you know ten transactions for that particular yeah. year of that particular thing. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You think? Well, it's it, it's bad if you're if if you remember the days, and especially working for Gru and uh, you know we pretty much set the prices and and people kept the price list uh, that were sent out. Uh, that was about the only price guide available. And uh, there's one price guide now in particular, the vintage guitar price guide. They've been doing it long enough and. For the run-of-the-mill models, they've got enough data that it's uh, mm -hmm. we we find it pretty accurate. On the on the rarer models, uh, where you know if, if it's a twenty thousand dollar guitar, just a a couple of issues uh, of originality or condition uh, could make you know, five thousand dollars difference in the value. Right. Uh, it's the the guide a price guide is not as useful. Right, and, and then you also have the difference between collector grade instruments versus yeah. player grade. Right? Yeah. I'm a huge fan of player grade vintage guitars because they're yeah. much cheaper. <laughs> yeah, and so the down the downside of a price guide is so if you have something that's uh, super clean, yeah. super rare, uh, and that justifies you know a, a premium price, you have people saying, "Well, it's only you know it's such a you know it's ten thousand dollars in the price guide, and you've got it at, at fourteen. And so, you know, people will try to talk you down for that reason. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, you don't say it directly to them, but that's the find another example. And uh, you well, also... Meaning like, uh, if you yeah, don't yeah, like this yeah. one... Well, yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. You don't say it that way, yeah, but, sure. uh, uh, you know, that's the price. We think it's worth that. Uh, we're not known for for really high prices, I don't think. I mean, we get... I see some feedback that says, yeah, you know, they're... Their prices are way too high, but others say no, they're reasonable. Yeah, um, we don't jack up the prices so we can offer a huge discount, an artificial discount. Sure, um, and and we're usually a little flexible. It depends. Sometimes a, a, on a consigned instrument, that's the consigner's decision, right? Whether or not to be flexible. Um, but in in looking online, you see a great range of of asking prices for instruments that may appear to be the same and maybe not it, right. it's hard uh you know the hardest part of pricing is is to figure out how to adjust right for for issues and then sometimes the issues are issues that make the instrument worth less like uh you know let's say uh you know 50s gibson that had a neck break right right yeah but then sometimes it's things that adjust it up so for example mm -hmm. you recently had the ed king collection right uh here so like, you want to talk about that a little bit more and that makes the instrument probably worth more yeah uh yeah any kind of celebrity connection will make an instrument worth more and it how much more though again it's it's hard to figure out right um the guitar that ed wrote sweet home alabama on yeah uh a lot more, many times the the value of the guitar. I mean, it's an eighty three. I mean, a seventy three Strat. Okay. Yeah, it's it's worth a couple thousand as a guitar, um, and you know, it's it's priced at four hundred fifty thousand. Ooh. So, <laughs> All right. But, I don't have that much uh, cash in uh, well, my wallet right now. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. What, I mean, what's comparable? Yeah. Uh, uh, even uh, you know, 
maybe one of one of Clapton's guitars on one of his hits, but yeah. have any of his hits you know achieved the, the the cultural status of Sweet Home Alabama? It's hard to find a mm-hmm. uh, you, know, you know comparable uh-huh. example. Yeah, um, other things of Ed's uh, that he may not have used much. Maybe the price is is fifty percent more. You know, so yeah. you know, a thousand dollar item might be priced at fifteen hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, do you still co- have any of those guitars here? Or do you sell uh, them all? Um, yeah, there's there's still a few okay. left. Cool, a few things. I mean, it, you know, his road cases had uh, Leonard Skinner stenciled on them, so yeah, uh, those brought more than the than the average road case. Yeah, I bet. Um, and we've had other, and then there are various levels of celebrity. We we've, we've got a collection. Or, or what's left over from uh, the unsold still from uh, a, a Nashville guitar player named Leon Rhodes, who very few people outside of Nashville or outside of country music would know. Mm-hmm. Uh, he started his career with Ernest Tubbs band and yeah. then uh, was on the Opry staff band and the Hee Haw staff band and then just played a lot of sessions and was an incredible guitar player, you know, known mostly for country, but was really uh, could play jazz up and down you know could play circles around you Mm -hmm. and so you know his stuff um you know unless it's a guitar that he played a a certain lick on on a later recording of walking the floor over you sure uh you know that stuff you you kick it up maybe 50 percent maybe double on some of the cheaper stuff so yeah uh and you know, we had uh, a bunch of Steve Earle's guitars. Uh, so far, about 120 of them. Wow, he's got uh, 120 guitars. Oh yeah, and that was that was about half his stash. I Jesus think. Jesus Christ! But did, he, did you buy that, or no, did they no, on consignment? Wait, they were on consignment. Okay. And uh, he was getting divorced. And, oh. and he, uh, normally, we wouldn't talk about the personal lives, uh, yeah. but but he was very free with with that information, and yeah. um, and but he used them on a to varying degrees yeah uh you know here's you know this is a guitar i used throughout this whole album uh this is one i kept around the house and you know it was you know wrote some songs on it and yeah um, i just saw him play at willie uh, nelson's range at yeah. luck reunion so luck reunion mm-hmm. they're also past guests of the podcast uh, the event uh, yeah. the yearly event at willie's range actually they did start doing some stuff mm-hmm. here in nashville too and uh yeah he's he's still going strong man yeah but the thing you run into the 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 only drawback with with celebrity guitars is there are people who say, will say I'd I'd like to play that or buy that guitar but I don't I don't really care that it's Steve Earls mm. you know I'm not a fan and and yeah. so I just want to pay the regular price for the guitar and so it doesn't work that way yeah I gotta find a different one yeah. so so what I'm hearing is that pricing guitars is still somewhat of a dark art it, oh it definitely <laughs> it definitely is um, and and you know customers have all the the pricing out there to use uh you know to to try to get you to lower the price usually and uh owners of guitars if they want to sell or consign to us ha- use that same pricing information to to try to inflate the value of, of or get the most for their guitar yeah and hey, keeps it fun i'm sure yeah <laughs> yeah and there's some dealers who uh who who ask a lot more than other dealers let's say uh yeah for guitars and that kind of it makes uh, doing business more difficult for us it doesn't really necessarily skew the market but right um you know sometimes they say well somebody's got this out there for for 15 grand and you're telling me it's only worth 10 so well that's what i believe yeah it's, it's the, that's the only defense yeah yeah makes sense can you think of a time when things went really wrong in your business and what you do about it I don't think anything's gone wrong. Um, we've we weren't able to accomplish the some of the things that we thought we would. Uh, you know, some of the aspects of our business. Um, you know, we one we thought we'd have some room on the walls say, for artwork and, mm, and yeah. you know guitar and <laughs> that mu- didn't that didn't work out. <laughs> well, we, we we did at first, but it didn't sell very well. Oh, got it. So that was one of the things that fell by the wayside. Yep. And we did events here or you know small shows. Yep. And you know the stage, what looks like an amp display area, was a stage. Okay. And, and there's a sound system uh, that you don't see except for there are two speakers uh, hung from the ceiling still. And 
uh, there, there were a couple of factors that, that caused us to not, we did probably two to three shows a month mm-hmm. and had to stop doing it just because they were, it got to the point where there was no room on the floor to put chairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we just, we, we were too successful with guitars. Yeah. Yeah. So, so some things like that are, you know, fell by the wayside. They weren't really disappointments, but it's, uh, it would have been nice if, if they'd worked out. I don't, we've not had any big financial crisis. Um, you know, the the biggest uh, obstacle to success right now is, is the new sales tax laws. Well, well, there, well there are two things. One one is the is the uh, enforcement of CITES and uh, the Lacey Act. It's, oh, that's for the that's, Rosewood, right? Yeah, that's just made it you know, virtually impossible to ship any, any Rosewood at all. International. Out of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even to Canada. Wow. So, um, you can't, so for example, if you have like any, like, I think the originally is because people were making enormous, like bed frames out yeah. of rosewood and like, you know, the amount of rosewood you're using in guitar is not even close to that. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, that was like the real problem. Right. But now you cannot ship a guitar to Canada that has a rosewood fr- fretboard. Well, you, you have to get the permit and the office that issues the permits is so backed up we can't we were unable to get a renewal when when the government was partly shut down that was one of the offices that was shut down so they're so backed up uh, we we can't get the blanket license from which the the licenses from for individual shipments come that's been ass. yeah and and then the time to just to process one of these if you can do it uh, caused us to add about four hundred dollars. Jeez, and it was mostly just time. I think the permit, it, the actual cost of the permit was was right about a hundred bucks. Are you not allowed to travel with a guitar that has? Uh, like if you're uh, playing that, uh, a tour, touring or something. Like that? There, there's some. There, well, technically no. Really? But but, but uh, I think the enforcement people are you know make some exces- exceptions for individual musicians. I would not take, I would not travel with a Brazilian guitar. Um, you know, there's some which hard- is a lot of. Uh, I actually have a '63 yeah. LG one, which is like a student yeah. guitar at the time, yeah. and that is a Brazilian. Yeah. On it. Well, yeah, there's some horror stories. Uh, not so much in the U.S., but but in Europe, Germany especially, where uh, instruments have been confiscated and been in danger of, of being destroyed. What? Yeah. So, but yeah, that that's one obstacle. Um, yeah. And you're talking about what's a sales tax thing? Every state now can uh, collect sales tax on. A mail order. Oh, so it depends on we we have to be aware of the of the tax rate and the law about collecting that tax for not just every state, every county. So it used to be mm-hmm. that you could ship a guitar to New York City and they would not pay sales tax. That's on correct. It? Yeah. Right, and now that's not the case. Correct. Wow. Um, <clears throat> there are a few states that don't have sales tax, so they you know, it doesn't apply there. Right. And most states have a threshold, so. Uh, Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. If if you do less business than that in that state, then it doesn't apply. So then you have to keep track of how much business you're doing in each state. That's a pain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like just from a logistical standpoint. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. It looks like we may have to hire, you know, a full time employee just and probably a tax accountant. That's uh, a big uh, cost to you. Yeah, it's a huge cost. It's it's uh, not an effective uh, way to to collect more taxes. It's, yeah. So, you know, those are the, you know. And you're probably not the only small business that's affected by that. Well, no. Any, well, it just depends on how much business a small business does. The, yeah. uh, and it gives the, the, the smaller businesses who may not quite reach that threshold an advantage. Oh, I see. So if we do $100,000 of business in California, then we've got to charge, which we do easily, we've got to charge sales tax. And we've got to f- figure out what that proper tax is. By county. <clears throat> yeah. And we have, I mean, there are four different uh, sales tax areas in Los Angeles County alone. So. <laughs> what? Uh, how, so, how new is this? Uh, within the last year or so. That is crazy. Yeah. But the guy next to us, who, if he only sells one or two guitars in California, his customers don't have to pay the sales tax. Oh, because he doesn't. He does, if he hasn't reached the, the threshold. The, yeah. So it's like you get punished for being too successful. Exactly. That's gotta be frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, those are those are the the bad things that have happened. That you know, in in general, business wise, um, 
we couldn't be happier. We've grown every year. Yeah. And uh, every, everything's... I mean, you have... You know, there's no room for anything here. There's guitars right. every <laughs> inch of the wall yeah. in amps and every inch of the floor. So how are you going to keep growing? What are you going to do? I don't know. We're... we're you know, we go can, up? Well, we can go up a little bit. That, there are other problems with that. Uh, there's a limit to, to how big a building can be before sprinkler system has to be put in. Oh, which would, if it ever went off, it would destroy Everything. all the guitars. Yeah, and um, there's uh, we, we have parking problems here. As this area, this was a quaint, cool area when yeah. we opened the building, opened the business here, and it's we're increasingly. Uh, Surrounded by hotels and high rise. Yeah, so tell apartments. me more about this area. What did you see in this area when you first bought the building that made you think that, you know, even if the guitar yeah. business didn't work out, the real estate? Because, I, like we said, Third Man's around there. There's mm -hmm. a, a boot shop, actually, that yeah. I'm a recent customer of next uh -huh. door. Uh, and there's, uh, um, you know, a whole bunch of really cool business popping up around here. So tell me more about what did you see? Yeah, well, we are about uh, six blocks, I guess. Uh, Maybe not even that. Maybe three long blocks from the new convention center oh. that opened right when we opened. So yeah. we're uh, it's about a mile to walk from here to Lower Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans won't do it, but but Australians and Europeans will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lower Broadway for yeah. our listeners who may not know is kind of like the big. It's almost like the Bourbon Street yeah. or like the six like Sixth Street in Austin or Bourbon Street in New Orleans. Yeah, Boston. that's the the honky tonk yep. district. Yeah, and. So it's we we felt that that was that was a good distance to be away. Yep. Uh, you know, accessible but not in in the middle of it. Yep. Uh, and then the Gulch, we're right on the edge of an area called the Gulch that that was being developed. Then, uh, right in the center of it is the Station Inn, a, a bluegrass club. Okay. It's been there forever, and uh, some some shopping in that area, just on, <clears throat> within a stone's throw of our building. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a long-established uh, cafeteria-style restaurant okay. called Arnold's, and and we we call those meat and three because that's you you can get a meat and three vegetables. And there you go. People people don't understand what what meat and three. <laughs> I've never heard. But of But that that's before. it. Yeah. There you go. And then on the other side is a, a brewery, okay. a, a craft brewery, uh, the Jackalope Brewery that opened up uh, right when we did. Yeah. And there were a couple of other restaurants. Uh, probably six restaurants that literally within a stone's throw yep uh, one of nashville's biggest liquor stores is right around the corner okay um, so you can get at all your needs here yeah guitars liquor um, beer all yeah. the major food groups yeah and we did and across the street uh it's about to, to leave now is uh an interior design firm that, that has some cool stuff and there was an antique mall that had been there 20 30 40 years oh did they close that yep uh, oh wow! Those those buildings have all been bought and, oh. and then sold, and uh, there'll be a high rise there soon. Oof! So we're we're just we're getting walled in. It's a little rough by development. So the uh, you know all the things that made the Gulch attractive. Uh, I, I guess it's 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 about to be a victim of its own success. Too attractive. Yeah. Kind of like the tax thing. Yeah. You can't be too successful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so our our only alternative is really to to look for another building, and we're not very not very diligent uh, about doing that. Are you keen on doing that, or no, is it just I don't? I'd rather not move. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've tried to to keep a handle on the inventory, but yeah. it's, it's just impossible. As more people hear of us, more people bring guitars to us. Yeah, and so our, our inventory continues to grow. I yeah, we turn away more things. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you have to turn out away mm -hmm. consignment stuff? Uh, yeah, or, or stuff that's offered for sale. Really? Yeah, we don't buy. At first, we bought just about everything or, or consigned it that, that came in the door, and and now we don't. How do you, what percentage of the stuff that gets offered do you, do you take? Oh, much, still 90%. Oh, okay, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, whenever you decide to, all right, I'm, I'm slamming the door on this, then somebody walks in with, you know, a jazz master and a and a Princeton reverb and a and a you know some sort of '80s Les Paul. It's all stuff that that that's good sellable merchandise. Yeah. Uh, what? So a lot of our audience is uh, people who are either thinking about starting a small business or running their small business. What is the number <laughs> one piece of advice you would give to somebody in that situation? I would say don't listen to anybody else, uh, <laughs> and and don't think you're gonna match what what anyone else has done. Okay. 
because uh, there are there's so many factors that that have gone into our success. I I don't I don't know if we had, if we'd had a different location or just different timing uh, if if we would have been at all as successful. Uh, you know, I, I don't for a minute think we can just pull up and, and move somewhere else and everything will remain the same. Mm-hmm. Um, we had some advice from a, uh, a client and, and friend who's uh, been in the finance business for a long time. And, uh, and at one point he said, well, you know, you, you need to have a year and a half of cash reserves and, you know, whatever, you know, 50% of, of businesses fail in the first year uh, because they don't have, have enough cash. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 85% of businesses fail in, by the second year for the, for the same reason. And, of course, we didn't have any cash at all. And we probably would never have opened if, if we uh, listened to that. And I felt like, well, 50% of small businesses probably are going to fail anyway because the, 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 the whole concept of the business is, is, yeah. not, is not viable. And biz- businesses uh, are hard. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I don't know, it's going to, I would say, not, not as a piece of advice, but uh, an observation, you're going to have to work hard. Yeah. And there were two of us. I think that was one of the, the keys to our success. We were, we were both working you know, close to 80 hour weeks. So it was effectively, uh, you know, four people full time, yeah. uh, to try to get this going. And we opened, it was Christy and me and, and her son, Bo. Yeah. That was it. And how many employees do you have now? Oh, 20 or so. 20. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, speaking of which it's early in the morning and I know that you have a very <laughs> long day ahead of you. And that when we met early this morning, you said you were already behind. So I very, <laughs> very much appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today. Yeah. It's a welcome break. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I uh, look forward to uh, continuing to uh, see your success and, and stay in touch. Great. Thanks. Take care. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.